Hey, welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show, everybody. We're really excited to have you with us. Today, we're chit-chatting with Deborah Cripps, founder of Give Them 10, and we're going to be talking about dismantling the outrage machine. Woo! Deborah, welcome. I hope you've had a lot of coffee because this is a big topic, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. Well, it's going to be fun. You know, um, you're not the usual suspect as a nonprofit leader to be talking about this, which I love. I think this is a really cool thing. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. And I suspect that, um, you know, we're all having these conversations privately. I'm in small groups around the nonprofit sector. And so I can't wait to learn from you. When we talk about, you know, social division, we're in it. We're moving towards a general election in communities across this country. It's a little dicey at times. And so this is going to be a wonderful thing for us to kind of center on. You know, another thing that's wonderful to center on for me personally are my presenting sponsors, and they are amazing. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is our new Friday episode just dedicated to fundraising. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. And then 180 Management Group. Um, we have this amazing cohort of co-hosts. Say that fast three times. Um, and they join us from all over the country. They work in all different parts of the nonprofit sector. They are brilliant. And we've been rolling them out and introducing them over the last couple of months. I'm flying solo today, but I hope you've been able to get to know them because they're just amazing. As is amazing Deborah Cripps, founder of Give Them 10. Okay, I'm loving this logo. Talk to me about what Give Them 10 does. Well, I would be glad to. It's one of my favorite topics. So I'll start with that. Great. What in the world does it mean? Cats have nine lives. Give them 10. That's what it means. I love it. And talk about your work and what you do and, and where you do it. Well, I'd love to do that as well. And you're right. I am a different flavor from your usual interviewees. So I will take a minute to explain why in the world I'm here. Great. Um, I'm in Cincinnati, beautiful, hot and humid Cincinnati today. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the privilege to run a private foundation. Um, and that foundation is quite large and dedicated to the health and safety of cats in the Cincinnati area. You might know that as a private foundation, um, we have a strong duty to do as the grantor wanted. Well, Cats in Cincinnati, that's a pretty specific topic for a really big foundation. So we immediately kind of started looking at it a little differently. We, my team and I, are bankers by day. And <laughs> we work on this foundation also. But I think a key to this discussion today is that we are bankers. We're business people. So we approach the idea of cat welfare a little differently. We looked at it, at it as a business problem. Okay, what is the actual problem? Cats are being killed in shelters. Why? Because there are too many of them in shelters? Why? And how can we fix that? I have lots of puns, by the way. <laughs> Um, and that's how we got, uh, we began this and the give them 10 logo came from a very smart group of advertising people. I love it. I think it's fabulous. And I, I'm fascinated by anybody who, um, such as yourself comes from a different sector than to move into this. And I, I truly believe that that makes for a much stronger organization. Sometimes we are so impassioned, it actually becomes um, imperiling, right? I mean, because we take our passion over, you know, to an extreme sometimes. And we can't pull in those business concepts and those management concepts. And so um, I love that you're a banker by day. I think that's fabulous. And I think that's a really interesting, interesting um, piece of the pie on your leadership, on your leadership 
on your leadership. So congratulations. So let's get into this deeper discussion and have you give us your take on the outrage machine. I mean, for those of you watching, obviously you can see we have a graphic of somebody here who's pretty exercised speaking in a bullhorn. And um, for those of you just listening, um, I think we can paint that picture. There's a lot of outrage. Um, talk to us about what you're seeing and how you define this. Well, we didn't term, uh, coin this term, of course, um, but I think it's sort of taken off into the lexicon of society. Yeah. Everybody's outraged, right? Everybody's outraged about something. And right now in this great nation, we're all outraged kind of about the same thing, but on different sides of the fence. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. So what in the world does that have to do with cats? Well, <laughs> when we took over this foundation. It was a, a startup foundation and we've been working on it for about a decade now. Oh, okay. What we learned, and it, it took a while to learn this, is that the key to our success in solving our problem, I mean, we are business people. We understood there was a problem. We wanted to solve it. And I would say that the leaders in the nonprofit sector are similarly charged. There's a problem you're charged with trying to solve it. So we knew there was this problem. We wanted to fix the problem. And it turns out that the key to fixing this problem locally, and I would say anywhere, is to get people working together, to mm -hmm. unite them across all of their disparate lines. And you said something really important. Everybody is so passionate about whatever their thing is. And they're kind of stuck in their own story Yep. Um, and stuck in their own past and their own process, their own protocols. Once again, the business minds came into it and we call it silos. Um, in Cincinnati, all of the uh, shelters, so in our nonprofit world, we're talking about animal shelters. They were working very independently. Mm -hmm. They were not cooperative. They were not collaborative. They saw each other as enemies. Right. <laughs> right mine. Um, you know, we came into this not knowing anything and looked at it fresh, fresh eyes. And I think to your point, fresh eyes are a good thing. So we looked at it and said, what in the world? This cannot be an unsolvable problem. But the first thing we had to try to do is get them to work together. And that was taking away 50 years of history from them. And they remembered it too. They know all that history. They did not want to work together. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's fascinating to hear you talk about this, because I think that one of the biggest um, inputs to the nonprofit sector really in the last 10 years, maybe 15, has been the de demand by foundations and funders for collaboration, that they're the ones it, truthfully driving collaboration. It's not people that are just sitting around saying, oh, kumbaya, let's let's work together because we're stronger when we're whole, I think it's really been the fun, the funders that have said, okay, you know, you have 15 food banks in your community. That's not really a great way to solve a problem, collaborate, and then we'll put a pile of money in. And so I love that you, you know, you're a part of that type of a story. If, if you think about it, really interesting. Now, let me ask you about talking about outrage when you identified this and you went to those folks, were they reticent or did they think that they could, yeah, put down their, their sabers and, and, you know, chat or how did that look? Really interesting question. They were all outraged. <laughs> Maybe from our perspective, they were not outraged enough about the actual problem, which was cats being killed in shelters. They were very outraged about each other's activities, uh, maybe how they were treated in the community, maybe um, the community's buy-in, um, but they were all very outraged. And we saw right away, well, if we can channel everybody's outrage into sort of one funnel and get everybody working toward what is already their passion. I mean, again, speaking from our point of view, we're talking about cat welfare, Mm -hmm. These people already love cats. We didn't have to convince sure. them of that, right? Yeah. Uh, but we needed to figure out how to channel, how to funnel that outrage. And you know what I think 
it might end up being. And I think that this might resonate um, with, you know, all of the distractions and noise at hand um, right now during the political season is that if we can channel and funnel outrage, perhaps what we're doing is giving people, the public, a way to actually control something. I mean, you can give money to a cat shelter or volunteer at a cat shelter and immediately see that you've done something. You've actually helped fix something. You can control that. You can't really control what's going on in the media and in you know, all, all of the political noise right now. Mm -hmm. So I might say that that's part of it. We're channeling people. We're giving them an opportunity to actually take back control. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of take that concept and extrapolate it a little bit, I've got a follow-up question. Do you feel like it, it allows people to sense that their involvement matters in other areas, or is it just kind of a, a short-term fix? Like, how do you see that um, engagement maybe filtering out across, you know, our, our communities? I know that's a huge question. <laughs> because, really? I mean, yeah, it's a big but I mean, do you, I mean, do you see that as something that maybe it has like a pass through effect? I from our experience, I would say yes, because what we actually did, I mean, we're talking about two different things here. One, we actually succeeded in getting disparate shelter groups to work together um, into a coalition that we believe is sustainable. Um, it appears to be sustainable, perhaps even without our input and help. Um, but we're also talking here, your question is more about the public. Mm -hmm. I suppose what we've seen is that when we give people the way to make a difference, mm -hmm. and again, we're talking about cats, let them make that difference, tell them that they made a difference, and mm -hmm. show them that their input, money, volunteerism, whatever, mm -hmm. actually made a difference. They're then on the winning team. I would say that I think it does actually make a difference across the community. When you have people who want to make a difference actually go out there and do something about it and then feel good about it, that's the key. You have to let them know that they made a difference mm -hmm. um, and, and, and tell them or understand that they do feel good about it and remind them that they want to feel good about it. Yes, I think it can. I think so. Yeah, I think this is a fascinating conversation. I really, really do. Because, um, again, as we said when we kicked this off, not the likely um, suspect to have this discussion with. So it's absolutely fascinating to me. So from your lessons, and, and let's go back a little bit, uniting across divisions. I mean, you worked with folks that, you know, had put their flag in the sand. They were like, you know, sure, they were running the best shelter and everybody else was doing crap. And, you know, I see I think we can in the nonprofit sector, you can be mm -hmm. doing the work of the angels. But you see this, you see this in your community and it's hard not to sometimes feel it. Right. Because you buy into if, even as a board member, I can think of times when I would buy into other shelter services and I'd be like, oh, they don't do it right. We do it right. You know, and such a bad attitude, <laughs> such a bad attitude. But what do you see? Like uniting across divisions, how can we get there? Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge they didn't want to. <laughs> there, was, there was no appetite. I mean, again, so we get involved a decade ago. We look at the city of Cincinnati. We see all of the different shelters. And we're, it, it was obvious to us, if you would work together, and stop decentralizing, perhaps even start specializing, collaborate and specialize, we might actually solve the problem. Or, hey, did you guys really not want to solve the problem? And you just wanted to raise your own money and tell, uh, tell the public how well you did raising your own money? Okay, but I'm a funder and I'm here to try to solve the problem. Yeah. So I, I will say in the beginning, we did sort of hit people over the head with money and say, we will look at you to receive funding if you will start collaborating. Well, it didn't, it didn't really work at first. So mm -hmm. to get back to your question, how do you do it? Well, we kind of 
I'm not going to say made them, but let's say highly encouraged them mm -hmm. to at least show up. And here's the key. They started showing up and then they realized it benefited them. Mm -hmm. And now a couple, three years in, that's why we say we think that our coalition is sustainable because it, all of these shelters, they're getting something out of it, not just money from a big funder. And I'm not discounting how important that is on the ground, but they're actually getting help from each other. Um, they have monthly meetings that are relatively official, but throughout the month, they literally talk to each other about something that happened that day. Can you help? We need this. Can you help? Mm -hmm. It's really been heartening to see it, frankly. You know, I love that you use the word coalition because when I hear that word, Deborah, I think of organizations that can still um, have their own mission, vision and values, but they are, you know, actually pulling upon that word, coalescing with a group of other folks that might do things a little differently. But at the, at the end of the day, they all want to resolve, resolve the same problem you know, the, the umbrella aspect of it. And so that is a cool thing. I've got to believe that these folks never thought of themselves as joining a coalition in their community. No, no, I'm, I'm understating how much they did not want to do this. And I do, I do think, I mean, let's talk to your audience here. They saw each other as compet, they still do see each other as competitors. Everybody's fighting for the same donor dollar. So, okay, there's a little secret sauce here. It's a little unique. Um, you know, we're a big funder in town. And, and I have to say, we work very regionally now. We work within 100 miles of Cincinnati and we license nationally. We license all of our collateral nationally. Um, we've got some super great advertisements, just really, really good. Um, but getting these people to work together in what we think is a sustainable coalition is mm -hmm. probably the most impressive thing that we've done. I think that mm -hmm. might actually be our legacy. And that's why we really wanted to talk to a different audience and say, hey, health and human services, yeah. um, environmental issues, name your cause. I betcha, I betcha if you put your very sharp minds and skill sets together, you might actually be able to make more headway into solving whatever the problem is, the challenges you're trying to work on if you were if you'd lay down your swords um, and work on it together. Um, it has been an interesting journey for us. This is an absolutely fascinating discussion because I got to believe that you never, ever thought that this is how your day would go. Right. Like this is how the arc of your work and service would actually play out. Right. I mean, because. I, we don't talk about this in the nonprofit sector and this competitive spirit. I mean, if we were talking about, you know, the bank or the savings and loan down the street or the credit union, you and I would be able to talk and have a language and a vocabulary and, an, and knowledge of competition. And we would see that as healthy and we would have all these other structures, but we don't talk about this in the nonprofit sector. So I find this absolutely fascinating and, uh, Really, really good. Good for you. And I, I agree that we can learn. I got to ask you this next question. And and when you talk about having the, the power of funding behind you, what are some of the skills that you can see help bring about this unity? Like it can't just all be about the money or is that how you start the conversation? Should we go out and find a funder to say, get behind us and help us build a coalition? Or what's your guidance on that? I mean, I think it might be as simple as that. Yeah. We decided, and I, and I have to say, this this was not an initial um, knowledge point. We came organically to all of this information. It did take quite a while to figure this part out, which is why I'm talking about it now, hoping others can benefit from the years we spent doing it. If you could find a funder who could somewhat hold hostage these disparate groups, sure, that's a shortcut to doing it. But I would offer that what we found, um, just again, talking about the cat world, that what we've noticed is the way that this has become a sustainable coalition isn't just the monthly meetings where everybody shares what's happened you know, in their shelters that month, but during the week when one shelter gets um, a cat hoarding problem or a bunch of kittens in, 
you know, they'll email each other and say, hey, we just got, you know, 25 kittens. Can anybody help? Once they realized that others could help them solve their problems as an emergency, like kind of in crisis mode or, oh, my gosh, we ran out of this kind of food or we have an injury that our vet isn't comfortable taking care of. Once they realized themselves as shelter leaders, as nonprofit leaders, that they could benefit from this coalition, that's the muscle memory that made it sustainable. I love that because I can see that going through to so many different areas from sponsorships to, you know, staffing, um, you know, uh, campuses, things of that nature. Somebody's got, you know, extra desks or computers and somebody else doesn't have any. Um, let me ask you a follow up question to this. Have you seen within this uh, new coalition folks having joint events or are, are they still trying to do their own thing? Have, have you seen it weave into that at all? Really good question. Um, I would say historically, every shelter kind of did the same stuff independently, which again, made no sense to us as business people. Right. Um, since the coalition really coalesced, um, I, my answer is that they're still doing their own events. They, you know, they each have their own gala, their own fundraising, their own social, but they have jumped on the idea of, a, you know, regional uh, wide adoption um, event. Sure, because they're used to each other now, they're a little bit more willing to sign on. Um, but I'm not going to say they don't still do their own fundraising. And I, I think it's good that they do. Absolutely. And, and I should say, um, you know, what we found is that the key to really all of this messaging, I mean, sure, the shelters talk to each other. But if we bring the public into this, because that's what we're talking about, too, is getting the public's buy in. Right. Mm -hmm. Social media is absolutely the way now. And anybody that's not using good yeah. social media tactics, strategies is really missing it. It's the least expensive method of communication with the public. And it so happens to be the most effective, um, the way that you can get the most metrics. And I, it's interesting. I think that, um, you know, your leaders that are listening to this call, I would think perhaps to them, their most important um, teammate is development. Development is super important, but anybody that's not doing really good social media work, really professional social media work is, is missing um, missing um, the future, really. The, the, yeah. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, it's immediate. You can marshal people and their energy and their resources. You can respond to something super quickly. And, and I agree with you. And, and especially when you're looking at this um, flare up of attitudes or upset or, you know, cause, um, that becomes even more important, right? I mean, because you can get a message out quickly and you can get, you can calm people down quickly too. It's not just about inciting them, but it's about, you know, showing a path that's maybe more positive. Okay, again, we don't have much time left, but this is something that I'm really interested in because I'm, I'm I don't want to say suffering, but I'm thinking about this myself. And that is, how do we end this fear of speaking up when there's division? Like when you first got that group together and you you were looking at really trying to educate and encourage them into committing to a coalition, I bet there were a lot of crossed arms, like people that were sitting in, you know, around the table saying, mm, yeah, I'm going to hear what everyone has, has to say before I'm giving up my secret sauce, as you said. How do we deal with this? Well, um, you're right. There were eye rolls. There were arm crossed. There was every kind of, of negative body language possible. Yeah. And I'll tell you, and I, I wonder if this resonates as well with the leaders um, here today. All of these people had, like I said, literally 50 years of baggage. So one of the first tools that we brought to the first meetings were I'm going to let you say it today one more time. I'm going to let you say your baggage one more time about each other if you want to. And actually, they did speak up. If I would, if because I knew the baggage, I could bring up a topic and I knew it would spark discussion. I let them have one meeting 
where they were talking about all that stuff. And then we said, no more. We don't want to hear about it anymore. This is a new day in Cincinnati. We're moving forward now. We're no longer looking backwards. And it worked. Fascinating. So you really called them out. We did. You like, yeah, you let them have their voice, but then you said enough, it sounds like. We did. But the way that we got them to actually, you know, the first person to speak was pushing buttons, I admit it. Like I said, we knew all the stories. We had spent the last year or so hearing nothing but the stories. So when you start pushing buttons, people start talking. So the outrage comes out when you know what buttons to push. I'm suggesting that we take the public and channel the outrage into our causes. Everybody needs a passion, of course. Right. Well, and I think people want to invest, whether it's money or time or talent, or as they say, treasures, um, into something that has impact, right? You know, so and so when you said this at the top of the show, which was fascinating, is that when people show up and they volunteer and they do something and they're part of something positive moving forward, finding a solution, um, whether it be temporary or for that moment or, you know, just a small part of something, that's a good place to be, right? And sure. I think then it moves into other parts of your life. And uh, which I hadn't, to be honest, until we started talking about this with you, I hadn't really put as much uh, value on um, and how this all works, you know, in other ways. I think that's a really good thing for all of us in the nonprofit sector to remember is that, you know, we can bring people into our organizations on a lot of different levels. And it does help, I think, um, in a civil way or civic behavior across across the landscape. Um, Absolutely. I think that nonprofits are in a very unique position these days. Mm -hmm. um, we all have something really good to say and, mm -hmm. and a, something really good to ask. We, we have we can talk to the public and say we have a problem, but you actually can help solve it. Right. That's not the message we're getting in the political discourse. Mm -mm. Not at all. No. No, you're abs you're absolutely right. If anything, we're I think so many of us are paralyzed to feel like there's nothing that we can do that's going to help abate, you know, whatever we believe in, right? Whichever right. part of the divide. Um, and I think that that's that outrage machine, you know, paradox, if you will. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed, I'm laughing because I'm just like, I've really enjoyed this. I'm I have to say, Deborah, I'm kind of like flummoxed because I didn't think that this was the way this conversation was going to go, right? I really didn't. And so I just have loved being able to chat with you and, and learn from you. Deborah Cribbs, founder, Give Them 10. Check out their website, givethem10.org. You can learn more about their work and what they do. The story of how Deborah came to be in this space is absolutely fascinating um, on her bio, or I, I call it your bio page, but um, the, uh, under the, I think, About Us tab, you can learn more about this um, organization and, and, and how it was formed. It's really a fascinating piece of um, civic engagement in, in, in the community of Cincinnati, and I've really enjoyed meeting you and having you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, you know, we have a lot of fun day in and day out on the nonprofit show because we have these amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are day, with us day in and day out and um, really allow us to have these amazing conversations like we've had with Deborah Cribbs today. As we leave you, we leave every episode with this message, and it means something different to me, honest to goodness, every day. And today, yet again, after talking with Deborah and how we can be more coalesced in working on solving our problems, the message is simple. Just stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody.